Good morning, church. As Nathan said, uh, Revelation 19, but I, I got a couple of things I just want to uh, just mention before we uh, get there. First of all, uh, best week of the summer is high five our uh, day camp, and Liz is out in the West Lobby, and she'd love to chat with you after the service. We showed a great video last week and put that on socials this week. Uh, so if you uh, would like to be a part of what happens here, this entire property is just taken over and uh, we just had an incredible week, then please uh, stop by and see Liz after uh, the service. The second thing I want to say is I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not a movie critic. I mean, I like to criticize movies, but I'm not a movie critic. Um, and, uh, but I just wanted to say this, like Cheryl and I went and saw Jesus Revolution uh, yesterday afternoon, went to a matinee. And like as, as strongly as I can recommend this and tell you to go, you need to go and see this movie. And it is an incredible movie. And, um, and believe me, like I'm in the category of most Christian movies are super lame. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Don't leave me hanging up here. Most of them are like super bad acting and terrible script writing and completely implausible. And this is actually a true story. It's an awesome movie. Cheryl and I have had the privilege of worshiping in a Calvary Chapel uh, once and, and just knowing something about that movement and to see the founding of it and how it came about and, uh, and really told in a very uh, faithful and reliable way. Um, you're just going to be moved. And, and I'm telling you, it's not, only, it's not entertaining in, in, in the sense as, as the primary purpose for you going as a Christian will be to challenge your Christian life and to think deeply about how you're walking with Jesus and the nature of church and all of that, because it's going to upend some of that. So go ready to hear from the Lord at the Cineplex. Does that sound good? Yeah, I know. Amen. All right. Ready for the word? Six of you are ready for the word. I'll try again. Ready for the word? Yes. That's better. Man. All right. Um, let's talk about weddings. I've had the privilege as a pastor, as you, as you can imagine, to, to do many, many wedding ceremonies, to perform them, uh, officiate at them. And, and one thing that I've noticed, which is it's not earth shattering, everybody will know this, but all of the attention at a wedding, all of the attention is on the, it's on the bride. All of the attention is on the bride. Uh, the groom, I mean, he enters from a side door somewhere and some guys follow him out and stand on the stage. It's not really about him. Uh, the guests, I mean, they come, and they're bringing gifts, and, and they're coming to celebrate this, but they just get ushered to a seat and essentially forgotten. Even the parents, I mean, they're paying for it all probably, and they just get put in front seats, and, and they're really not much better than guests. And then the, but listen, and, and, then, and then the pastor, really, he's just there for his signature on the marriage license. I mean, that's all they really need him for. And then the bridesmaids. The bridesmaids, arguably, they get a little moment. You see, the bridesmaids come out in their beautiful dresses, and they each get like eight to ten seconds of fame at any wedding where they walk down the aisle and before they take their position on the stage. So they get their little moment to shine. But then, then. Everything goes quiet and the music changes and everybody stands up and, and, and everybody's heads turn toward the back and the doors open and out she walks in her glorious splendor of her beautiful white wedding dress and she walks down the aisle and, and it's all about her. And it's just like us as human beings to put the emphasis on the wrong person because it's not about her. We think it's about her. We make the entire wedding about her the bride. But in the imagery of the scriptures, it's not about the bride really at all. In fact, in John 19, 9, I've offended you. I can tell I've offended you by your reaction to that opening illustration. But in, in verse 9 of the passage we're looking at today, the angel says to John, blessed are those, listen to this, blessed are those, got the imagery of a wedding here, blessed are those who are invited Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, we will talk about the bride in this passage, but in this particular sentence, there's no mention of the bride. The Lamb, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lamb is the groom. The invited ones are the guests. In fact, this imagery of a marriage and the end times, this imagery is used in other places in the scripture. Jesus told two parables in Matthew's 
that are recorded for us in Matthew's gospel. In Matthew chapter 22 and chapter 25, he tells two parables that have, again, a marriage picture, an allegory of a marriage that points toward the end times. And in both of those parables, Jesus neglects, intentionally does not speak at all about brides. He talks about the groom in both of them. He talks about the invited guests, but he doesn't talk about the bride. Why? Why this emphasis as we see in Revelation 19 on those invited? Because Jesus is so concerned that every living human being knows that they are invited to this marriage supper of the Lamb. That he himself, the groom, has invited them to his marriage to come and be a part of his eternal union with the bride. And in fact, in this chapter and and coupled with what we'll see in chapter 21, we're gonna see the culmination of this beautiful marriage picture that we've been seeing throughout the scriptures, in fact. And so the question must be asked, the question that must be asked from today's passage is this, have you RSVP'd to the invitation that Jesus has given to you to the marriage supper of the Lamb, this wedding of all weddings? Have you given your RSVP? So let's turn our attention to the scriptures. We bit off a huge chunk last week with all of chapter 18. We're gonna break chapter 19 into two messages. We're gonna look at the first 10 verses of this chapter uh, today. So you follow along in your Bible, Revelation 19, one to 10. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For his judgment, his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you, his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride, his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so there are some implications to that invitation. First is this uh, command to join the celebration. Verse one, after this, John says, after the destruction of Babylon, after everything that we saw in chapter 18, John says, after this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of this great multitude in heaven. This is the assembly of all believers in heaven, or it's the assembly of all angels in heaven, or maybe it's the combination of both angels and believers standing before the throne. And they're crying out, hallelujah. Curiously, this word uh, appears four times in this chapter, nowhere else in the New Testament. It's a Hebrew loan word to Greek. That means that it's a Hebrew word that was transliterated into other languages, not just Greek as here, but also into English, French, Spanish, whatever language where you simply say hallelujah, that's a borrow word that's come to us from 
Hebrew. It means praise Yah, hallelujah, praise Yah, Yah short for Yahweh, the name of God. So praise Yahweh. They go on to say, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. This is the very character of who he is. These are the attributes of who he is. And the 24 elders who we've seen before, the four living creatures, they fell down and they worshiped God who was seated on the throne, the symbol of his sovereignty, of his dominion, and of his power over all the earth, saying again, Amen, so be it, hallelujah. Verse five, and from the throne came the voice, not the voice of God, but close enough to the throne that it comes with the authority of God. Perhaps one of the four living creatures saying this imperative, praise our God, the force of a command to us as believers to praise our God, all you who, his servants, all who fear him. And then notice this phrase, we're, we're coming right down to these last couple of words here, small and great. The invitation is going out to all, to small and all the small ones, all the great ones, all who would hear this invitation. It's a broad invitation to all to respond to the gospel. And I think about parties because this is a grand party in heaven. And I think about the kind of parties that we get invited to, the kind of parties that human beings throw. And the reality is that it isn't like this, that we don't generally invite to our parties both the great and the small. We tend to invite according to our own socioeconomic group. The rich invite the rich to their parties. The poor invite the poor to their parties, and the middle class invite the middle class to their parties. Our invitation lists fall along socioeconomic lines. But evidently, this is not true in heaven. In fact, if we could make two little points here, your money and power, which is not wrong to have money, it's not wrong to have power, but your money and power cannot buy you privilege before the throne of God. Because the invitation goes out to the great and the small, to the rich and powerful and those who are poor and have no influence. The second little point I would say is this, the church is to do all it can to reflect that future reality now. We're to live this out in the context of the church community, that we should be welcoming in to this community, both the great and the small. If you have power and rich, you are welcome here. If you have none of this, you are welcome here. And we bind ourselves into community, the kind of community that would honor what we see here happening in heaven where the great and the small come together. Now, this is a concern. Don't dismiss this principle too quickly because within really a decade or two of the church being established after Christ's resurrection and ascension, this was a problem in the church. And in fact, James wrote about it. James, the half-brother of Jesus, he writes this letter. It's one of the earlier letters in the Bible. And he says this, he says, this is James 2, 1 to 9. He says, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Show no partiality. Now, if James is writing to a collection of believers about partiality, it's because he's heard that this is happening in the church. It's a challenge for some of them. He goes on in the passage, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he went on to describe a scenario where when they were gathering for church on Sunday morning, that both a rich man and a poor man came in. And in this particular scenario, the poor man was kind of pushed off to the side. Why don't you go sit in that back corner over there and no one took him to his seat and maybe just stay over there out of sight, out of mind where no one can smell you. And a rich man came in, fine clothes, looking really rich. And he got ushered into a front seat and here, sir, you sit here and here you go. And is there anything else that can get you? This is the scenario that James is building. They were treated differently. And James says about this, he says, they'd become the people in the church that, that were 
were showing this partiality. They had become, this is his phrase, judges with evil thoughts. They were making judgments of people based on what they looked like when they saw them come into the lobby of the church. Instant judgments based on appearances. They had made judgments. They had become judges with evil thoughts. Even as I was preparing this and thinking through this, I was going like, how many times have I done this? How many times in, in the more than, more than 40 years that I've been walking with Jesus, have I made an assessment of somebody in the lobby of the church as they've come through the door? Or as I've walked into the worship center and seen them sitting somewhere? What are they doing here? They don't really belong here. They don't fit with us. I wonder if any of you did it this morning in the parking lot or the lobby or as you came in the room, making assessments on people based on a visual appearance, what you saw. Have you become judges with evil thoughts? I mean, James doesn't leave it there. He goes on to say that when you do that, listen, when you do that, his words, you blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called. To, to make this kind of judgment on someone on the basis of appearance, on the basis of socioeconomic status, you make that kind of judgment. You, it's not just evil thoughts. You've blasphemed the name of Jesus. That person is in the image of God. And he says, if you show partiality, to just culminate that little section, those nine verses, if you show partiality, he calls it what it is. You're committing sin. We're being invited to a wedding banquet. Everybody has been invited to come, to hear the gospel, respond to it, to be part of this wedding banquet. That includes the great and the small. And so we shouldn't be policing the, the guest list, so to speak. In fact, the church is to make every effort to live out the kingdom of God now, however imperfectly we might do that. Every effort to take what we see in heaven and make that happen now in the church. I mean, if we could really latch onto this, what we would be doing is reading a passage like this, reading about the marriage supper of the Lamb and locking that image into our hearts and minds, like just getting it locked into our minds. So that's the way we perceive what we're doing right here, right now. We get a picture of eternity in our heart and mind and then we ask the question, what can I do to live that out here and now? And if you get a bunch of people who are doing that, if we got all of us to do that so that we had that picture of eternity in our mind and we come here saying, we're going to make that happen today as we gather together, you get a bunch of people doing that together and you radically alter the culture of a church. Radically alter it. Think of it this way. There are no socioeconomic divisions in heaven. So let's do that now at Harvest, amen? There is, as we've seen throughout Revelation, there is passionate worship in heaven. Let's do that now at Harvest, amen? There is, we've seen in Revelation, every tribe, nation, people, and language in heaven. Let's do that now at Harvest, amen? Everything in heaven, as we're seeing again in this passage, everything in heaven is centered on the throne room of God and his dominion and authority. Let's do that now at Harvest. Jesus-centered, gospel-centered, people of God, impacting this world for Christ. And if we build that kind of kingdom of God on earth 
now kind of community, that becomes this really powerful evangelistic strategy in the community in which we find ourselves. You have that kind of community living out that kind of heaven now existence, and that becomes attractive to those who don't know Christ. Because it stands in sharp contrast to what they're experiencing out in the world. This is what the world values. This is what the world is doing to us today. And in this generation, more than at any other time in my own life, this is what the world offers. The world offers us more and more divisions based on race. We talk an awful lot about racial reconciliation, and we have, in my 58 years on this earth, never been most, more divided on those things in our culture. It's shocking, but what the world is doing is not working, and everyone notices it. So much animosity based on race. So much, so much increasing disparity on wealth in our culture. The erasing of the middle class. So much, so much in terms of power imbalances in the world. Never has the electorate felt more powerless with respect to its own governments. All over the Western democracies, this is true. The world is offering people nothing. And we have the words of life. We have the gospel. People are experiencing all this angst in our society. And instead, we're going to be part of what John saw and heard here, verse 6, the voice. We're going to be part of the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the Almighty, reigns. It's a party. It's a celebration, the most awesome one of all history and one that people should want to be invited to. So Christian, listen to me, coming from my heart. We have to rise above the nonsense of this world. And you've heard this repeatedly through the book of Revelation. We need to rise above the nonsense of this world. We're not even citizens of this world. I'm a Canadian by birth. I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's handy, it's handy if you want to travel. It's handy. It's not my citizenship. I, I don't belong here. I haven't belonged here since the moment I came to faith in Jesus Christ. My citizenship in that moment was transferred to the kingdom of God, and that's my home, and I am an alien and a stranger in this world. We're citizens of, of the heavenly kingdom. We belong with this multitude in glory. And when we read passages like this, and I'm telling you, it's just going to ramp up as we move through the rest of 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 in this, in this book. As we, it, our, our hearts are going to ache for this. And they should. And so we have to be careful to put human politics behind us and be done with the animosity that both the right and the left are manufacturing to divide us. To keep people at odds with one another. Both the right and the left exalt their own platforms and dogmas. And all of those platforms and dogmas ignore the one who is on the throne. So let us, verse 7, see it here. Let us re rejoice, let us rejoice and exalt and give him, give Jesus the glory. Let's join the celebration. And this celebration, by the way, marks the passing of evil. And we've been seeing this as we've navigated chapters pretty much through our whole series here from chapters 6 through 18. This is what we've been seeing, how God is going to deal with evil. But we're coming to the end of it, evil's final defeat, and we'll give him the glory, verse 2, because his judgments are true and just. That's kind of the general sense of who God is, but then in a very specific way, he has judged the great prostitute, Babylon. This is the world system that we've been talking about all the way along. It's this prostitute, Babylon, who has corrupted the earth with her immorality. And this is not just 
as we've seen, this is not just sexual immorality, but immorality of all kind that is actually rooted in spiritual adultery. This at its core is idolatry or anything that takes the place of God in our lives. It's the worship of anything else. And God has avenged on her the blood of his servants. That's been a prayer request and a longing for the martyrs throughout history. So they can't worship enough. They can't celebrate enough. So verse three, once more, they cried out, hallelujah, the smoke from Babylon goes up forever and ever. God's doing this. It's gonna be over. Of Evil has been eradicated. And this needs to be proclaimed by us because this is such a comforting thing as we deal with people outside in the world who are struggling with this. The one thing, in fact, that will help you and I process and persevere through all the moral decay decay that we're seeing in the world. It's so discouraging to read the news and to see how far our country is drifting away from any sense of morality. It's true throughout the Western world. It's discouraging. It's crushing to us. And if that's your steady diet, it's going to crush you. If you set your eyes and your heart on the evil itself, and that's what you're consuming, if it's continual news, reading, watching it, listening to it, if it's continually being on social media, interacting with all of this, if you set your eyes and heart on the evil itself, it'll consume you. If you think that there's hope for this world to to turn around, you'll be crushed by that thought. If you become obsessed with trying to lobby governments and push back against the tide, If you think that your next social media post is going to be the turning point for culture, then you'll be hit by a tsunami of corruption and immorality that defines this world. But if you remember what we've just read here, that the smoke from this world will go up forever and ever, if you can keep that in mind, this is a comforting thought. God's going to vindicate. God's going to take care of it. Evil will come to an end. And then you'll be able to live a beautiful Christian life at peace with God, at peace with others, and even at peace while the world is going to hell around you. And at peace with yourself. And you'll be able to be then, because you've, you've gotten to this place, you'll be able to be on mission to tell other people who desperately need to know this handing out invitations to the wedding that Jesus is offering. John, who saw all these visions and, and wrote the book of Revelation, also wrote a couple of letters, three letters. And he, in, in 1 John, he wrote this. It's just so simple. The world is passing away along with its desires. It's such a matter-of-fact statement. But it's a reminder to all of us that we're, we're investing in, in a fool's errand if we're continuing to invest in a world that is rejecting God. The world is passing away along with its desires. We should not be surprised by the moral decay. decay. But listen, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Amen? Let's celebrate that. Let's celebrate that. And let's get ready for the big day. Let's get ready for the big day. The big day is the wedding, right? This is what we always say. Like if, if someone gets engaged, like an engaged couple, like you, you, you see them and uh, you find out they're engaged and it's congratulations. The first question you ask is, can I see the ring? That's the first question. Unle- unless she's already standing like this, Okay. But then you ask, when's the big day? Anyone engaged here? Anyone engaged in the room? You're engaged? When's the big day? See that? Anybody else engaged? Anybody want to be? No, it's it's fine. That could just get awkward for some couples. So I won't. Here it is, verse 7. Look, it continues. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his bride has made herself 
ready. We do get to talk about the bride for a little bit. So understand that what we're seeing here, the lamb, the lamb is the groom. That's Jesus. The lamb is the groom. And the bride is the collective people of God from all epochs of history. The people of God, such an important phrase. All the believers before Israel was established, all true Israel, all those who were true Jews who believed in the promise of Messiah, and all Christians who have named the name of Christ and found the forgiveness of sins, all of them together are the collective people of God. They're the bride of Christ. But we come individually, so collectively as the people of God, we're the bride, but we come individually as guests to the marriage supper of the Lamb as well, invited guests to this wedding reception. Now, the challenge here as you're reading through stuff like this is in English class, if you remember English class, if that doesn't trigger anybody, but if you remember English class from high school, what you have going on here is a mixed metaphor. And, and, and a teacher would knock you down for that. You'd lose marks for putting a mixed metaphor in. But in the apocalyptic literature, it's quite normal to have these visions, different illustrations and metaphors all folding in together. So you, as an individual believer, are a guest invited to the wedding reception, but collectively together we're the bride of Christ. We occupy both of these positions in this beautiful marriage supper that's happening, this marriage that's happening we are both bride collectively and guests individually. And in this instance, we're focusing on the preparation of the bride. And, and you know, John's Jewish and he's writing this, he's seeing these visions, he's, he's thinking about Jewish marriage ceremonies as he's thinking about all these visions and the marriage illustration, the metaphor is used throughout the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament, in various places. And John's got this in mind and, and John Wolverd, he, he talks about the Jewish marriage ritual had three parts to it. Let's go through these and, and we'll see how this relates. Jewish marriage had three parts to it. The first part was the betrothal in which the formal engagement was agreed upon, the bride price paid, and the couple legally became husband and wife. So this is like our engagement plus because there's actually a, legally, a legal binding agreement that has been put in place. So the example of this is Mary and Joseph who were not living together, had not yet come together in one household and not yet consummated their marriage, but they were legally bound together. That's why when Joseph heard that Mary was pregnant, he said he was going to divorce her because they already had the legal agreement in place. They just hadn't gotten yet to the second part of Jewish marriage. So that's the betrothal. Second part, the coming of the bridegroom to the house of the bride with his friends to get the bride and take her to his home. We actually have an example of this. I talked about the two parables in Matthew's gospel, that the two parables that Jesus told. In Matthew 25, he told the parable of the 10 virgins. Five of them were ready for the bridegroom to arrive to take the bride to his house. Five of them were not. And that's the lesson there is you gotta be ready for Jesus' coming. But the point is, we see it illustrated. The bridegroom going to the bride's house to take her, all of their attendants would come with them, take her to his house. And the third part of Jewish wedding. We have the betrothal, then the coming of the bridegroom to bring the bride to his house. And the third part is the wedding banquet itself. And that's illustrated in Matthew 22 in that parable. Now, that's just super interesting, right? It's like, oh, I'm so interested in that, right? Like, we, all, we just got our knowledge increased on Jewish weddings. How awesome is that? But let's think in terms of us in Christ. When we're converted, we become legally bound to Christ, but we haven't yet been brought to his house. We're still living down here on planet Earth. We're legally bound to Christ. We're his and he's ours. When he returns at the end of the age, we come into his house in heaven. That's the second part of the Jewish marriage. And then the third part, when we're in heaven, we enjoy the wedding banquet together, what we see pictured here and in Revelation 21. And so make yourself ready for this. Here's the first way by clothing yourself in righteousness. And before we talk about what it means to be clothed in righteousness, let's establish, first of all, that the initiator behind all of this is God. Verse 8, look what it says here. It was granted her. The theologians use a phrase here called implied actor. We have a passive statement. And so the implied actor it was granted her, the, the implication is it was granted her by God. God is granting her, the bride, 
to be clothed in this way. So our salvation, here's how that relates to us. Our salvation, our sanctification, our ongoing process of becoming like him, and our glorification is only possible because God initiates it. That's a controversial statement because from our perspective, we don't quite see it that way. We see our own initiative. We see our own free will in this whole process. We see a decision made. We see a path that we followed. We see circumstances of our life that contributed to what happened. We see the influence all around us that we created, that was part of our life. But the one who is sovereign over all of this, who wrote our names into the book of life, he sees that differently. You know, if I could relate this to my own conversion when I came to Christ, I was in my mid-teens, around 15 years of age. And from my perspective, here's what happened. I heard about a youth event that was going on at the church. And so that night, I made a decision. I made a decision to go to that youth event. And when there, I decided to listen to what the speaker was saying and to think deeply about it. And when he had finished saying what he was saying, he, he made an invitation for people to believe what he had said, to raise their hand, which I did, and then to pray the prayer that he led us through. From my perspective, I'd made a decision to go, a decision to listen, and a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ that night and pray that prayer. That's my perspective on it. But again, the one who's sovereign over all of this sees it quite differently. Because here in the passage, it tells us what it's already told us four times before in the book of Revelation and multiple times in other passages of the scripture that there is a book called the book of life of the Lamb. And that names were put into that book before the foundation of the world. Before God said, let there be light. If you're a Christian, your name was written in that book. My name was written in that book. And so all of those things that I think were me, a decision I made, a path that I followed, circumstances in my life, God initiated. God was behind every part of it. He ordained the decision. He set out the path. He caused the circumstances. Now listen, I get that that's very hard to understand. It's, it's hard to grasp, in fact, the implications of what I've just said. And it's helpful, I think, it's helpful to know that the Bible reflects both of those. The Bible tells us very clearly that we are elected. The doctrine is called election. It, the Bible talks very clearly that we are elected or chosen to salvation. There's no denying that. The Bible also says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in those two concepts, we see both God's perspective and our perspective. I was grateful that when I was in a college, Bible college and seminary, I had a professor who was wrestling with these very same issues. And he said this, and this is a paraphrase of what he said many times in classes I took with him. Dave Barker said this, the moment that we reconcile God's sovereignty in choosing us for salvation, that's the doctrine of election, the moment that we reconcile God's sovereignty with our free will to choose to be saved, we become unbiblical because the Bible does not reconcile them. The Bible teaches both. And I just need to ask you, are you okay with the mystery of that? Because I get that it's hard to understand. And it's a mystery because it's rooted in the mind of God. And it's not something that we as human beings can possibly fathom. And we still have to live our lives out down here. And that's where we should be living our lives, acknowledging the truth of God's word, acknowledging the truth of the doctrine of election, but then still pleading with people to accept the invitation to come. And so God initiates, if, if you can, if you don't want to walk out right now thinking I'm a heretic, we come to this and we see God initiating that the bride 
Verse 8, can clothe herself. God initiates this. God granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Even, even the righteous deeds, even the righteous deeds that we're clothing ourselves with are from God. I mean, we, we see the word righteous deeds, our righteous deeds, and we think right away, well, you know what? I did a pile of righteous deeds today. I woke up, I did a pile of righteous deeds. You know, I, I, um, I, I brought my family to church. I came to church. I worshiped. I gave an offering. I'm listening to preaching. I served at 9 o'clock in the 9 o'clock service. Like, I did a bunch of righteous deeds. But that's not at all what we're talking about here. We're not talking about your church attendance, your service for him, your giving, your witnessing, or your charitable act. Because all of those fall into the category. If you think that that's the thing that's earning your salvation, listen, I'm telling you, those all fall into the category of what Isaiah 64, 6 calls filthy rags. All your righteous works are as filthy rags. The word, by the way, means menstrual cloth. Disgusting. That's what your righteous deeds are. So these things don't earn us anything. It's not any of these things in terms of earning our salvation. Now listen, I want to say this really carefully. I want you to catch it. Our salvation is earned and kept by works. Everybody hear that? Our salvation is earned and kept by works. Only it's not our works. It's the works of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is earned and kept by the works of our Savior. His incarnation, his perfect life, his crucifixion, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to the right hand of the throne of God, and his return in the clouds in glory. And we're going to see it. We're going to see it when we study the second half of Revelation 19. When we look at this next week, we're going to see this white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And notice, in righteousness, these are the righteous deeds that God is going to clothe us with. They're the righteous deeds of Christ. In righteousness, he judges and makes war. He's the one on the white horse. He's the one leading the charge. We're all behind him on little ponies. We're just following along. We're just along with Jesus for the ride. It's awesome. He's fighting the battle and winning it. It's his righteousness that clothes us. And we receive this, as the reformers say, we receive this sola fide, by faith alone. A couple of things that the apostle Paul wrote that I think are helpful here. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. No matter how good your works are, it's not going to get you there. It all comes as this, as this gift. It's the gift of God. And, and those who interpret the Bible, they, they, the, the theologians, they, they argue among themselves, what's the gift of God here? Is it the grace? Is it, is it the salvation itself? Is it the faith? Is the faith? the gift of God. And I'm like, I don't care. I think the whole thing's a package. I think it all comes from God. It's like you've opened up a box that you thought had one gift in it, and it's multiple gifts that God has given to us to have this relationship with him. To the Galatians, he said in very similar language to what we see here in Revelation, this is Galatians 3, 27. He said, for all of you who were baptized into Christ, notice this, have clothed yourself with Christ. Not clothe yourself with your own righteousness, but you've clothed yourself with Christ himself. Now listen, it's also clear, and I feel I need to say this, it's also clear from the scriptures that the ground level visible evidence that you have clothed yourself with Christ is to be a growing Christian. So these things that I talked about, they're filthy rags in terms of earning salvation, it can't get you there, but they do speak to the veracity of our faith. 
that we must, as Christians, evidence the faith that we have with our passionate worship. We have to evidence it by walking with him faithfully in the pursuit of holy living. We have to be working according to our gifts. We have to be witnessing of our faith to, to others. So is there evidence in your life? Is there evidence that proves the legitimacy of your profession of faith in Christ? Or in the language of the metaphor, are you wearing a wedding dress? Have you made yourself ready for Christ? Are you clothed with his righteousness? Are you wearing what a bride wears? Are you, this is from chapter 7, verse 14, are you wearing robes made white in the blood of the Lamb? Now, it follows that we would be clothed, clothing ourselves in righteousness and, in order to do that, carefully heeding his word. I hope you never wonder why as a church we put such an emphasis on preaching when so many in our day are downplaying the proclamation of the word. And by so many in our day, I mean like churches. Churches are downplaying the preaching of God's word. And uh, we're very committed to not dumbing down the preaching in order to get more people in the building. It's, it's not something that we're ever going to do. This angel says to John, he's pointing John to the word. He said, these are, verse 9, the latter part, these are the true words of God. What you're hearing here in chapter 19, what you've heard in chapter 18, what you've heard in all of the Revelation, listen, it's the words of God, the true words of God. And if you want to get serious about life and eternity, I'm talking to you now, I'm talking to myself. If I want to get serious about life and eternity, I'm going to get serious about this book. I'm going to see that this is the final authority in all matters of life and godliness for my life. This is the source of my authority. These are the true words of God. And specifically in the context, the angel is emphasizing the blessing that's attached to all of this. Will you believe the word of God that bless it, look at this, bless it, verse 9, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Will you believe that word? That if you've been invited and accepted the invitation, you're blessed for having done so. We need to believe that as we continue to live our life out down here with all the challenges that we face. The angel implores John, and he's imploring us to believe this because we tend to, we tend to struggle with believing the word of God, especially when times get difficult. In fact, we tend to reset our belief system. We're very good at resetting our belief system every time we face trouble, or if we're not facing it personally, every time we see trouble around us in the world, we can reset our belief system and not in a good way. You see, in easy times, when things are good, when God is just pouring out the blessing and things are awesome in my life, in those times, I acknowledge all the wonderful things about God and everything that he's given to me. It's so easy. I acknowledge that he loves me. God loves me. Everything's going well in my life. God loves me. I'm his. I belong to him. He belongs to me. God has a great plan for me, and it's just working out so perfectly. I know I'm heading to eternity. I know that he wants to bless me. In easy times, it's very, very easy for us to acknowledge all of that. Wouldn't you agree? But then, God in his sovereignty chooses something for us that isn't so pleasant. We end up having to go through a difficult season of life some difficult path, something, by the way, that every human being has to go through at one time or another in their life, and immediately I reset what I believe. I forget that he's good. I question that. I can forget that I belong to him. I forget my identity. I forget that his intentions for me are good, and I forget that this world is not my home. I forget to trust his plan. In hardship, I'm tempted to forget what I believe about God. And here's a strange little illustration of, of that here. John, 
John in the midst of this, and, and I can understand why it happens. John's getting all these crazy visions. He's been transported from his earthly life into sea eternity, and, and, and there's no time up there, and so things are all over the place, and he's naturally a little overwhelmed by all of this as we often get in the midst of our own challenging circumstances when things overwhelm us. So notice in verse 10, in the midst of all of this, he's just being told about the word of God in all of this. And in verse 10, he falls down at the feet of an angel that he knows is an angel. He falls down at the feet of an angel to worship him. But the angel said to John, stop it. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he directs him essentially back to the word of God and he gives him a two-word command. He says to him, worship God, don't worship me. That's the word of God informing that. Now John commenting on this says, notice the last line, it's outside of the quotes. It's this little commentary by John. He says, for the testimony of Jesus, a phrase that we've seen all the way back to chapter one, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the word of God. This is the gospel that you have heard preached concerning Jesus Christ. His life, his ministry, his care for others, his preaching, the signs he performed, his death and his glorious resurrection. This is a command to worship Jesus. This is a command to get back to the word and to believe the true words of God. Now, that's, that's a message to believers, but for unbelievers, they struggle in a different way. This is, this is often the point that keeps them from God. There's so much evil in the world, or I've had so much heartache in my life, I just feel like God hates me, or God's forgotten about me. And a lot of unbelievers are sitting in that place, and it's a totally legit question. It's a big question that deserves a very full answer. We don't have time for for today, but there is a good answer. But what we see here, this is a start to the answer. Look at it here that God will take care of all of the evil. That's what we're seeing in Revelation. God's gonna take care of all that evil. And we need to trust him. God's gonna take care of all the evil according to his perfect timing and plan. And in the meantime, trust his word. Trust his plan, accept his gracious and loving invitation to come and be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. Amen? Let me pray for us. Father, again, there's um, application for all of us here. I pray that as believers, we would be um, further encouraged and just built up in our faith to understand in a greater way how much you love us, how much you care for us, uh, how these promises are being fulfilled and will ultimately be fulfilled in their entirety. God, where there's areas of our life as Christians that we need to repent of, I pray that you would show that to us. Holy Spirit, come into each one and convince us of the truths we've heard and convict us of the sins that need to be repented of. And help us to live in holiness, to, to wear these righteous garments, this fine linen that is rooted in the righteous acts of Christ. For those who are in the room, who may be watching on the live stream right now or who are watching on demand and who don't yet know Christ as Savior, the invitation is there. Father, I pray that they would hear it. The invitation to come, send in their RSVP, to repent of their sins and to find hope in Jesus Christ join the celebration that's going on in heaven right now. Thank you, God, for hearing this prayer, for being a God who delights to give good gifts to his children. We pray in Christ's name.